Well, thank you for having us. Thanks for coming down here to the Little City. brother, anytime. Uh, so don't really know what you guys are interested in. Uh, came through the election, Colorado had Republicans had some small victories. Uh, session starts January 8th. Uh, I don't look for a whole lot of change in the way things have gone. It's still kind of an attack on rural Colorado just because they don't really understand us out here. Um, I had Kit Carson Rural Development contact me today about a bill that was ran in 22 uh, that uh, kind of put some uh, onerous regulations on uh, building efficiency and stuff, and it really hurts the smaller communities. So I may be trying to uh, address that in a bill this year. Uh, Representative Winter and I are running a bill together. Uh, has to do with trying to add one more uh, rural member to the stack uh, with CDOT. Uh, Try to give us a little more voice. Uh, that's some of the bills I'm running on. Um, I mean, what Senator Palton said is true. The rural urban divide is huge at the state capitol. There's so many bills they pass with the consequences, they don't realize how they fall down on our rural counties, especially frontier counties. We see it especially with housing and zoning. And some of the ideas that they have, I mean, they basically want to, their goal at the end of the day is to put housing along the highways and train routes and basically stack housing. So then there's less transit. It doesn't work in our part of the country. I mean, Rocky Ford, whether your community should grow the way it wants to grow. It shouldn't grow the way the state mandates somebody four hours from here to tell you how to grow when it comes to your zoning, your transportation. And what we see is a redistribution of wealth a lot of times. I mean, like the electric vehicle tax credit. I mean, they're taking taxpayer dollars out of rural Colorado and they're funneling them to the inner city. And so many times we're on the outs. I mean, we really see it with housing as well. Housing needs in rural Colorado are different, especially as we see like what they call the silver tsunami. I mean, we see people, we don't have transitional housing for our aging population. And these are things that they don't understand. They've got a young, vibrant community up in the Metroplex, and they don't understand the intricacies of what we face down here. So we've really had a battle with zoning and things like that. Building codes, that's another thing. I mean, it's impossible. Asbestos abatement, last year we ran a bill to put, there's money and a cash fund on fines to be able to help with, just like Otero School District, their bus barn. You know, it was cheaper to build a new <coughs> bus barn than to take the asbestos out of the old bus barn. So what I see at the state capitol myself and the senator sees it is they just don't understand our way of life. Two years ago, we did a rural tour and we invited city legislators to come into the district. We actually did one stop here in Rocky Ford and we talked to the vegetable growers and we talked about how they had the laws, okay? So they changed the laws for labor. And we talked to not only the growers, we talked to migrants who are upset because they can't come here and make the money they wanna make because they're limited to hours. We took them to an energy production in Los Animas County. And that's another thing that we face. Uh, we've gotta be real about this. I'm a huge proponent of nuclear energy. Uh, I believe in small modular reactors. They fit on the size of a Walmart, the footprint of a Walmart and its parking lot. And I'm here to tell you, the green energy push in Colorado is taxpayer funded and it's killing the state. Ever since we've started this, the cost of energy has went through the roof. And what scares us in rural Colorado is, is we need firm, reliable power. And I do not believe, I, I'm an all above energy person. I believe we should shoot oil, gas, coal. We could have some wind, we could have some solar, but to just bank on what the state is as their carbon free goal by 2035, I think it's unattainable, especially for rural Colorado because one thing we have seen is if they start to have rolling blackouts and brownouts in Denver, if you don't think they're gonna push your power north, then you haven't been at the state capitol very much. So that's why I'm a huge proponent of small modular nuclear plants. Um, this year I actually, we came down to Harris Pharmacy and spoke with your pharmacist, hi, great guy, having a huge problem with PBMs and it's killing independent pharmacies. So running a bill, we're going after Big Pharma this year and we're telling them you need to be able to make sure that people, in, I mean, the pharmacist you have in this community is unbelievable. It costs him money to put prescription out in this community. And he takes that on his back. And to have somebody like that in your community is huge. So we're gonna to try to help with that. Um, we're running the stack bill. Uh, the ranchers asked me, uh, I'm running a no lab growing meat bill. I mean, we're competing with the wolves. Thank God we're not competing with the mountain lions right now. But that's another thing is our farmers and ranchers. Um, out of the state house, y'all, I grew up, I live on a ranch in Los Angeles County. Out of 65 members, there's only two of us that come from an agricultural background in the whole state. How many of you all in the Senate? Four? Yeah, four. So you only have six voices out of a hundred that come from agricultural background. Uh, last year, the Senator and I, we ran 
the agricultural stewardship bill, which will help our farmers and ranchers. Um, it's a tax credit if you're doing rotational grazing, rotational crops, interseeding. And we're always trying to put money back in the district. We all pay taxes here no different than they do in the Metroplex. And you need to see a return on that dollar too. Um, so many times though, I will tell you this, we're left out in the cold in rural Colorado. And that's why we urge you all, we need you all to testify. And when these bills come up and they're gonna affect Rocky Ford, you have our contact information. You please get on the phone at any time. I mean, that's our job. We need to have that interaction with you all because as these bills are being passed, you need to reach out and be like, we're Rocky Ford, Colorado, and this is how it's gonna affect our budget. You all deal with unfunded mandates all the time. That's another thing that we see come out of the building is it's a constant stream of unfunded mandates. The big counties, it doesn't hurt. The big counties do just fine. But the small rural counties and frontier counties where you know, your staff here, you're having to add staff members to do little ticky tacky things. We see it in education as well. So the big thing is, is the disconnect between the two different ways of life. And what's really unfortunate is, is we, it isn't like we live in two different parts of the state anymore. It's like we live in two different states. And it's, it's just not right. And at the podium all the time, I tell them we're a proud people. These people just wanna to go to work and they wanna make a living and you're taking industry away from them. Whether it's farming or ranching or oil and gas, it's not right. They're salty, there's people who just wanna to go to work and take care of themselves. And then you take away their way of living and then you hook them on government money like a drug. And that is not right, especially for rural Colorado. Um, I don't know, what other bills are you running, sir? Okay, so uh, I'm running one. We're running one for rural hospitals. I can't remember the particulars of this. Uh, being a, a rancher, all my bills have to do with rural Colorado or uh, agriculture. And every session I've run a rural hospital bill. Last year I ran one that if you were a critical access hospital, right now in the state of Colorado, you have to license as a general hospital also. So when it comes time to uh, have a capital improvement, a uh, construction project, you have to buy two permits. This bill will help save up to $50,000 whenever that happens. And all our critical access hospitals usually run into debt. So every dollar we can save helps you know, them take care of us whenever we need it. So uh, let me try to take the reins off of government a little bit. So I ran the physician's assistant bill two years ago. We all know that healthcare is an issue in rural Colorado. This bill isn't gonna fix the problem, but what it allows is a physician assistant, it used to be they had to work under direct supervision of a doctor, now they can work in collaboration. So if you have a doctor and a physician assistant here in Rocky Ford, the doctor decides to leave, that physician's assistant, as long as they're collaborating with that doctor, can still stay in practice. And that's a huge issue. Um, I run education bills, um, Senator Pelton and I ran a bill that way, superintendents and principals that are retired and already collecting care can come out of retirement still collect para while putting into para to teach because that's another hole that we have to fill in rural Colorado. It's hard to recruit young teachers to rural Colorado. Um, no different in Trinidad, Rocky, Fort Lamar, the nightlife isn't big for kids coming out of the city with the degree to bring their families into it. They also look at healthcare. You know, they look at schools. So that's another thing for us to recruit these people, we have to start making our communities compete a little bit more, be more vibrant. Uh, another issue that I'm, tackling this year is the landlord issue. In Denver, don't get me wrong, they're slumlords. One of the unintended consequences of legislation they passed, it is killing our small town landlords. I mean, I've had landlords come to me and say, Rep Winter, we can't even go talk to somebody about their house. They can threaten us. They've made it basically where the renters have control and the landlords can't do anything. And that's really unfortunate. I will say it, it seems, it's almost like they're trying to push people out of the private property business. With all the re legislation that they're running on housing and on landlords, it's almost like the state wants to take over the housing, which should scare everybody. They even passed a bill that they can build housing on state land now. Um, they all, they try to pass the right to first refusal bill, which would mean if you own a home and you decide you wanna sell this complex, say it's a five apartment complex, they can hold that sale, Rocky Ford can hold that sale for a certain amount of days. It doesn't matter if you have a private seller on day one, they can hold that sale. Now they can't lowball you on it, but they can hold that private transaction up. And what's scary about that is, is we have landlords and property owners coming to the capital constantly saying, we've invested our lives in these rental properties and the state keeps putting their thumb on us. And those are things that hurt rural Colorado as well because if you want people to come in and invest, they're afraid to invest. We have businesses leaving the state because of the clean air policies. 
This year we watched for the first time ever at the Capitol, I think I've seen it, is we had labor come up and testify against these bills. We had the steel workers out of Pueblo come in and testify against them. We had the pipe fitters union come in and testify against a lot of the legislation. And what I truly believe is, is I think that the Metroplex is out of touch with the rest of the state. And that's our job to tell your story. And when I go to the Capitol, I try to tell the story of House District 47. And that's why your input is so important to me. Because if you're not giving me the background of how it's affecting your community, I can't go to that dais and can't represent you the way you want to be represented. So my big thing is I urge you all, please, if you see legislation that's coming down the pipe that you think is horrible, send emails, make a phone call. I've read statements from city council members. This is how it'll affect our city and I will go up there and put it on the record. And we need to start working together as a team in rural Colorado. Um, we need to start banding together um, I know we're a bunch of little voices right now, but we need to come together as one solid big voice. Because we're really being, and, and we're not looking for sympathy, we're really being left on the outs, y'all. Um, we're an afterthought in that, in that building, and it's really unfortunate. And if we don't start banding together and screaming out loud together, um, we're going to find ourselves under the bulldozer even more. And you guys can now testify remotely from your own home. That's one good thing that did come of COVID. You don't have to go to the Capitol or to the local college to testify, you can do it right from your own. Yeah, you can definitely, like he said, you can sign up and testify here from county <coughs> chambers. Is there any questions anybody has? I want to make sure we're covering everything you'd like to. I've got some questions or concerns. Just, uh, you know, first of all, I understand there's a lot more people, there's a lot bigger tax base in the metropolitan area versus out here where we are. But like you said, we count, we matter. My concerns for me, I would say the biggest one is utility bills. When I get my utility bills, 25% of that bill is actual consumption of the commodity and the rest of it is fees, transportation, delivery, and all this. You know, can you help us in that one? I've got three, I'll give you all three and then I'll let you. Uh, another one is public transportation. We have really no public transportation out here, very little, you know, to get to I-25 where there is better transportation. We have not much out here. And then once again, the infrastructure is for roads and bridges. I mean, you know, we have a lot of two-lane highways. A lot of roads. I've done a little digging into it. There's a lot of money being spent. And sir, one thing I've learned in that building is, is we don't have a revenue problem. We have a priority problem where we put our money. We put our money in some insane things. Um, when it comes to the energy, I, I hate to beat that drum, but the green energy push has cost the cost of energy to go through the roof. <coughs> That's hurting it as well. And roads and bridges, this is what makes it hard about severance taxes is DOLA, they cut back 23 million last year in DOLA grants because that money is no longer there. Last year we swept $10 million from severance tax to balance the general fund. This year I think the governor is sweeping $8 million. Department of Natural Resources, 92% of their budget comes from severance tax, which comes from oil and gas production. I don't know where we're gonna make that up. We are starting this session $900 million in the hole. The governor reached out on the assistant minority leader and said, assistant minority leader winner, if any of the Republicans have any legislation that has a fiscal note, tell them not to bring it. That means it's even worse for us, sir. Um, utility rates, like I said, there's going to be, there, actually I know there's going to be some legislation this year. I know Black Hills had actually come out and made a statement that they're going to reduce off of theirs. Um, I don't know if it's enough, but they have come to the table. But I do know that Representative Martinez out of the Valley, I think, is going to run some legislation to try to address that. <laughs> He, uh, he really went after Excel really hard on the last year. Um, but no, those are all valid issues. When it comes to the, the roads and bridges, though, I mean, if there's no money for DOLA grants, it's hard for you guys to apply for those grants. Another thing that makes it hard is it's having such a small staff. You know, these big cities, they have grant writers. They have people on staff doing this stuff, applying for corridors. That's where all the CDOT dollars go. Yeah, yeah, they want to take okay. people up to the slopes. Yep. You know, <laughs> I mean, they, there's a lot more squeaking going on up there than out here, but um, we did an audit of CDOT a year ago, uh, found a lot of discrepancies, but it's an enterprise fund and they answer to nobody, not even the government. Mm -hmm. the government. So uh, we are, I sit on the audit committee and I look forward to this audit that Rep Winter has just mentioned. Uh, that's an even numbered committee, but it still takes a majority to bring an audit. So it has to be show enough discrepancy to bring an audit. We tried to do that with the Secretary of State right before the election, and it was a 4 4 vote. So. Well, and you bring up the front range. So our ranch is right off of I 25, and I'll tell you what, 350 is a lot better highway than I 25 is right now. And that's because the governor appointed a director to CDOT that had no clue 
anything to do with highways. And that's another thing we've seen is some of his appointees, they have no expertise in the area that they're working in. And that makes a huge difference. I mean, you have this beautiful capital in the last two years is we take care of all this, I will call it a lot of nonsense where we spend money. And at the end, we scream fire departments and kids because those are the things that grab people by their heartstrings and get them to spend that extra money in the end instead of doing what's right and put that money in front and making sure those things are funded in front. And then another thing is, is legislation. It is so lopsided in that building, there's no sausage making. So my first year, we spent more time fixing bills than had been passed the year before because you don't have to sit across the table and work. When you're in a super majority, you say, I have a bill, we don't need your votes, sit in the corner and shut up and we're gonna pass this legislation. That's another thing that hurts us because one committee they do listen to is on those agriculture because, I mean, you can think you know a whole lot of a whole lot of, but if you don't know what end of the calf comes out of than the cow, you're at a disadvantage. They just want our water. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. that's another thing, and, that, and I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, they talk about sustainable growth. Well, sustainable growth is off the back of rural Colorado and agri-centered communities. We all know that. Um, I will say, though, our water lady, she, she fights like heck for Colorado water. We've really put pressure on the states and down in the compact, Arizona, Nevada, California. Um, they're starting to tell them that if we're gonna have to cut back on golf courses and green belts, then you're gonna have to figure out a better way to deal with your water. So I will say that the gal that we have working for the state now, she fights pretty hard for the water, but you're right. They're trying to take water out of rural Colorado. And I mean, you see what in Bent, Colorado Springs Utility is deep in Bent right now. Um, I've heard, I'm sure you've heard of their program where they come in and if you've been flood irrigating all these years, they figure how much water you use flood irrigating. Then if you put pivots in, they figure how much water you'll save by sprinkling, and then they get that perpetuity, that water. So if you use a million gallons a year, and then with sprinklers, you only use a half a million, if they come in and pay for your pivots, but they get that half a million gallons for lifetime. So you're right, they're, they're coming after our water. They can't grow without it. And to piggyback a little more on the CDOT, they have become a green energy department, not necessarily a highway department. They're putting in charging stations and pushing the Green New Deal more than they are asphalt. <laughs> Perfect example is the funeral home bill that was passed last year. Representative Soper had our staff go through it. They put money in there for electric chargers in a funeral home bill. They try to sneak things in <laughs> left and right. He's 100% correct. But you talked about the tax base being up there. Um, Agriculture is still the number one producer in this state, and we constantly tell them we feed you, we clothe you, and we heat your homes. And uh, every time we talk during lunch and they're eating, I look at them like, hey, you guys enjoy lunch? Well, thanks, thank rural Colorado today because they're the ones that put that food on your plate. But that's where you all are the cavalry. I always tell people this is a 50-50 deal. I'll leave my family, I'll go up there for four months, I'll live downtown Denver, which is a tough thing for a country boy. But when it comes to the, your 50%, that's when we need you guys to ride in on the horses and testify and talk about these things. Because it, your voices are important. Um, we talk so much up there, sometimes we're kind of like that person you know that writes the letter to the editor every week and then after seven weeks you just see the name and you put the paper down. When you're up there fighting like we do for you all, there's times that it falls on deaf ears, but when they're sitting in committee and they have to talk to the five or six of you and hear your point of view, they go, oh, that stuff Rep Winter is bringing up, these are the concerns of his community because that building is politics and it's unfortunate. It's There's a lot of, politics in that building where voices don't get heard. Um, but that's where we need you all to, to really step in and testify and help on this stuff. Yeah. One little question. Is there, is there anything in the agenda up there for uh, military? Because we have one clinic right here in La Junta and it's a little tiny one. And then like if you have PTSD, you have to go all the way to Denver, which is 180 miles. That's federal, sir. Also, the, you know, but is there anything on the state level that can help with the rural communities to get something? Because, you know, like, I know the VFW, the American Legion are all around. We only have one, and the nearest VFW is pretty far. You know, it's, it's over in Ordway, and there's one in Las Animas. But, you know, is anything on the state level to help veterans to do something? You know, just... Right. We, we would love to, but like Ty said, we're $900 million in the hole. There will be no money going out to it would be nice to help in those yeah. kind of areas. Yeah, because it's a tough one. It's like, I understand. Well, in Trinidad, our guys have to drive to Albuquerque to get yeah. service, and they can't even go because the way the regions are set yep. up with the Fed. And I have friends that have cancer that have to get treatment in Albuquerque, make a four-hour drive when they could go to Springs. Um, I think 
I think that'll. I think you're going to see that change nationally, though, because I think you're going to go back to where vets can choose their doctors. Well, they could choose them now. Oh, they can. Yeah, but okay. it's still you know to well, get to get one going here. Well, there's it's hard, in his no county, choices. If it wasn't for you can only see a doctor about every two weeks. Uh, yeah, regular MD. Yeah. 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 And the ones that are suffering are the older ones, you know, the World War II ones that are dying off now. It's like that's right, and it's hard for them to get good care. We also brought up public transportation. Right. right. <laughs> well, we have that at the Pueblo, and there's that bus runs no matter what, and sometimes empty. Yeah, up and back. Empty. Yeah, the bus stops the cross street from my house. I get to watch it. See it. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you. Yeah. I mean, you as tax priority issues. You as a taxpayer is paying so that empty bus can run. But it goes back to what you originally said. They started running those so they could get to the ski areas. Um, last year I did. I wrote a, I wrote a, a pretty scathing letter to the governor. I'm sitting in Denver. We've been dealing with snow out here on the eastern plains for 12 days. And all of a sudden they're going to get a snow and ski country. And he called it a range rail forever. And they want us to subsidize it. And all they've said is we're going to push it east and west. Now, that's where the population is, but once again, we're being left on the outs. We'll get the tail end of anything if we do get it. So you got rail transportation to Lahana South, Lahana East. I mean, it used to run to Pueblo, and then the buses got two people or no people. Get a smaller bus. You know, don't I, I see the big bus that shows up there, and then a lot of people I don't think are fully aware of schedules. Yeah, the schedules usually don't fit with what you need. Or they're behind, and the bus broke down. I mean, it's always right. something with bus. Now. Well, we learned it in rural Colorado, unfortunately, you have to do more with less, and that's a constant they don't care about. Your sheriff, I will say that you've got a sheriff that he does more with less, and he finds a way to do a Sheriff Mobley, you sat down and talked to him, and he gets things done with hardly any money. So, <coughs> I mean, it's really important that, you know, when it comes to transportation, we have a lot of people encouraging people to use Uber, trying to get people in their community to start Uber, and actually Uber people around. I know, it, believe it or not, there's a... Uh, Uber Eats in Trinidad now. There's a guy that decided he's making a killing. We got one dude in Lahana, I think. Yeah. yeah, he's making a killing doing Uber Eats. He quit his job. He's so busy. So, you know, that's one thing we always try to encourage people to do is, is I mean, the free market. Try to get, you know, encourage people. You know, you want to start a business? Why don't you start an Uber service? You know, because when it comes to, like he said, public transportation dollars, if there's no grant money left, you guys don't have a grant to apply for. So is there any way, how, how much more are we going to be able to increase infrastructure money for rural Colorado? Um, is there anything in plans or? I, I don't see anything for, for at least a couple of years. Okay, and what about like highway use taxes? Um, is there any, any way, anything in plans that's going to help us increase the amount of taxes we're bringing in for highway use taxes in rural Colorado also? Actually, I see that declining because of the push for hybrids and electric, because uh, it's on gas and yeah. sales. Yeah. Yeah. sales. And that sucks because yeah. that's something we yeah. depend on a lot is highway use tax, you know, um, yeah. to yeah. fix our roads. And Highway Patrol actually took another 5%. They used to just take 20, now they take 25 off the cost to come in. So, okay. And then on top of that, the statistics just came out day before yesterday, and once again, we're in the top two states for highest inflation. Rate. So. So now you just said, just hit on, it might it might be dropping because there's more non-gasoline combustible engines. They're, they're going the electric, electric start, start charging them more for it. Yeah. I mean, putting up all these charging stations for them, put a user fee on that. No, so we're giving them rebates. Okay. <laughs> because we're, you know, this is something that is said all the time, and I'm not trying to ruffle Thank feathers. Thank you, guys. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Sorry there was more money, sir. Mm -hmm. Call the I governor's just thought I'd ask if there's something that, you know, might be in place that no. might be trying to help us out a yeah. little bit in rural Colorado. We, we try. We fight for it. Okay. We really do. Just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep fighting for Actually, there was a bill ran to increase from $25 a year to 75 for okay. electric vehicles. But when you compare Apple's battery, battery and everything, yeah. Yeah. and it's, they're hard on our first responders, our firemen. I talked to our local fire chief two weeks ago. And he has to have four different kinds of suppressants in case an electric vehicle. Control, if we sign on to this conduit, do we lose that access if somebody says we don't need it? The well, government decides it goes other way. I, I guess I wouldn't give up the current water rights you have. As a right. Uh, the, the number one reason that was put in was to keep drinkable water to the communities that are along Arkansas. I've been kind of in support of it. It sounds like it's going to end up costing 
you users along the river a lot of money. So I I don't know in the end if it is a good thing or not. But those do not give up your water rights. Of course that fails. Of course there was, decline. The, like the Ogallala uh, Commissioner uh, Freed from back in county, Walsh used to have four wells are down to one right now. Um, the, the, the farmers in Kansas are talking about it. So the aquifers are dropping. And like he said, it was it was to make sure that there was clean drinking water to the valley. But I've been, another issue that we're having is private property rights issues. We have tons of people that are upset where it's laid out, where it's gonna go. But in the state of Colorado, the constitution reads, they have the right for eminent domain, especially when it comes to roads and utilities. So that's, that's a fight that a lot of people are having right now. And unfortunately, um, the, the cards are stacked against them. But they're looking at the future, and it's more of a drinking water thing. Yeah, the hard part is that I think we've been paying it since... For doing doing her, her thing now. Part of this, you were asking about the water and how much it's going to cost. Now, if we got the forever chemicals... Now, she's she's falsifying, or she was falsifying, readings and reports at, at the chemicals. Now, if we have forever chemicals in our water, there might be more available from the government, my understanding from this, but... First of all, are we in Region 8? I don't even know what region we're in. I don't know what region you're in. We're in Region 8. Are we are in Region 8. So now we have concerns about that, <laughs> having false readings that were manipulated by her. We saw that with the CDI as well, the DNA testing. I mean, they're having to let people out of prison because there yeah. were faulty DNA tests. <laughs> it's happening. No, sir, that's a concern. You're right, and the forever chemicals are an issue. They're really having a problem with it. Pharmaceuticals are causing a lot of problems in the water because it's hard to treat pharmaceuticals out of water. Um, but no, and you know, I'm lucky where I live in Trinidad, our water supply is North Lake, so we get fresh, clean water. But by the time it gets down this way, I mean, it's been through a couple of treatment plants in between here and there. But no, it, it, and the forever chemicals are an issue that we're facing, 110%. Not only that, we get groundwater here from our wells, but yet we had the Army Depot that was there with all the munitions and everything, who knows what seeped. No, 100% correct. Oh, and correct. this water and sewage cost the small communities a lot of money because they have to all of a sudden come up to the new standard. Uh, my former house district up in northeast Colorado, I don't know what the answer is for our small communities. So far, Dola and some of them have had some grants that have helped out. Uh, pretty soon that money dries up too. We never seen revenue go down in the state. I mean, the marijuana tax is almost, I mean, compared to what it was, yeah, it's just falling through the floor. I mean, Last year when they did a study on growth, uh, the three that grew were restaurants, which are jobs coming back from COVID, hospitality, but the number one growing entity in the state of Colorado was government. They tie FTEs to everything. There is an FTE to scratch the back of an FTE to scratch the back of an FTE to pull out the keyboard for an FTE, to answer the phone for an FTE. I mean, there's so many FTEs in the bill. I mean, the government is employing so many people right now, and that's one fight that we have. I know our JBC members actually asked the state to do a hiring freeze and they wanted to do a decrease on staff. Like I think it was 5% and they're not gonna do that. So can we start a Colorado Department of Government Efficiency? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? That's, and that's why we're starting to run some of these audits. There's tons of waste. Uh, we could sit here and go through, um, I mean, we've dug out waste that would just blow your mind. And some of the stuff they're spending their money on is just insane insane and there's no benefit coming to the citizens especially communities like rocky fork in the six months or six years that i've been a legislator the budget is uh 50 again what it was when i first came in it was like 24 million when i first came in and there's almost 40 million or billion in this last budget so it's and we get good legislation passed i mean i've done 18 bills in two years and I mean, from anywhere from energy to health care to education, try to, you know, round robust bills, but anything that's really important from here, we get shot down. Anytime we try to grab at a piece of the pie or we try to fight to push something back, that's where we have no dog in the fight. It's because a lot of this legislation has unintended consequences. And uh, we do try to tell that story. And they give you, the, oh, we feel so bad. And that's as far as it goes because they don't vote any different when it comes to this stuff. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming. Um, Thank you for inviting us. Really wanted an opportunity to you know, sit and hear what's going on. Um, so thank you for sharing out some of those in the upcoming le legislative session. Um, and then, you know, it's really an opportunity to you know, meet the council um, and for the people to, to hear from you all. Um, you know, like we've kind of heard about rural Colorado, but you can almost, uh, you know, I, I 
I feel the same way about Rocky Ford when we look at rural Colorado as far as being left behind and forgotten. Um, so definitely want to do our part in, in changing that and making sure that Rocky Ford is um, heard and, and everyone knows that they're in the room. Um, so if there are any opportunities for us to um, come and lend that voice, you know, please uh, you know, reach out and want everyone to know and you know, for, for all the citizens too to know um, that they can also reach out to you all. Are you a member of CMF? I am. So yeah, they have a good strong voice there as well. So. And they'll give you a list of bills to testify on. Just tell them that you want the leg uh, legislative docket. You know, we really need y'all's voices. They need to hear straight from you. It's very important. So I have business cards. I'll leave those to the clerk. I'll I'll you know, you know, one of the couple of notes that I had written down, and I, I heard touched on it, but um, you know, I think it's that you know capacity for us. So. You know the funding that is there uh, we, we know that there's funding there um, but you know we don't necessarily have the staff to to be able to you know write those grants and administer them um, so i think the the technical assistance and you know being able to open that up and i would even almost say um, more intentionally for rural colorado um, i think that's that's <coughs> more and more helpful um, stacy and i are going to be on a call tomorrow um you know taking advantage of some technical assistance um, resources from from the state so you know at, when that comes up I think that is something that it, it's not the solution but it, it, it helps us when we're operating with the limited staff um, compared to you know, Winter Park or Boulder or somebody um, and then the, the other one is just any, anything around any of the, the cleanup I, I know asbestos has kind of been following that and we're gonna be going after that as much as we can um, we just had a, a 30,000 square foot building um, burned out down here in Rocky Ford over this weekend, um, an abandoned Still school building. School. Um, and you know, we had a, a construction, um, a brewer, our brewer construction burnt down earlier this year, so that's almost becoming uh, an epidemic here in Rocky Ford. And uh, you know, we're gonna be going as much as we can trying to you know find funding on the state level and the federal level for, for those cleanups. Um, so as, you know, if there's anything you're running or anything that you hear of, have some stories. Okay. We're definitely trying to help you tell the story, so let us know and we'll do what we can to work with you all. And thank you. If there's any other updates, we also do town halls during session um, via Zoom, so we can always make sure to shoot you the link and then if you all <coughs> if you could share it out, then um, we try to get constituents on to talk about issues. And we could even do one for you all if you want to do a town hall. Just let us know. I mean, I try to be as accessible as I can um, to any community. So. You know, as much as you'll invite me in, I'll, I'll try to help as much as I can. Same with the senator. Well, thank you both. Thank you. you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you at the outside. We'll see you at the outside. Stop and play darts. <laughs>